That the next speaker has a, a few characteristics in common with myself, and that is that uh, he's from the same hometown. He comes from a construction background. Uh, we were Pickett Construction, a fourth generation family business, and he represents the uh, fourth generation of his family business. But that's about where the similarities end, because uh, what our speaker has done is he has managed to parlay uh, the transition to the fourth generation very successfully, as you're going to hear. Birmingham uh, Foundation Solutions was founded in 1897. And knowing the speaker as I do, I can say with more than a little certainty that uh, he brings a, a host of talents that go beyond construction. Uh, he's a proven inventor with numerous patents to his credit, not to mention an accomplished uh, sculptor and painter. Like, um, like great buildings uh, uh, that require a solid foundation, uh, great businesses require the same. And um, he has certainly spent his time in the muck over the years literally and figuratively, and today he's going to tell us how uh, he rose back up uh, with Birmingham Construction, which is a foundation construction and equipment manufacturing company, and how he has gotten the business to where it now is a, a global leader in, in certain building technologies. So please uh, look forward to a, a wonderful presentation and welcome Patrick Birmingham. Right. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Andrew. He's helped me at numerous uh, junctures in my, in my business that helped me to discover that when I first took over and uh, I was having a very difficult time, I wanted to know what the company was really worth. And, um, and Andrew told me it was worth nothing. And, um, <laughs> and, and I believed him. Uh, he, he explained to me how it was valued and, and the fact that it really wasn't worth anything. And um, I would like to point out, uh, again, in the family ties, when my father did his work term outside of the business, the family business, uh, he worked for Pickett Construction uh, in Hamilton at the, at the time. But I'd also like to thank Robin for setting up the, uh, the stage for really long-term thinking. Everybody who's engaged in a family business is engaged in a long-term enterprise. And the ability to think long-term is exactly what we need more of today in our, in our business and our political world. As you know, governments have a five-year horizon, or sometimes a four-year horizon, and after that, they really don't know what they're going to do. But when you're setting up a, a business, a family business, you're setting it up to be successful for the next generation. You're, in fact, if you're doing it right, you're building a kind of cathedral. If you're very successful, you'll never see the last stone placed. In fact, you won't see any of the last stones placed. If you do your job very well, your company will outlive you and outlive you many generations from now. Um, in the Middle, Middle Ages, it took between 25 years and 600 years to build a cathedral. Some people saw them complete, but the average, average time to complete was about 125 years. So not very many founders who started a cathedral got to see the end of it. And I think that, that this can be uh, captured in this quote or story. In 1972, U.S. President Richard Nixon asked China's first premier, Zhu Enlai, for his assessment of the French Revolution, 183 years after the revolution's conclusion. Zhou's response is too early to say. <clears throat> and, and I really think that, I think he's right. That was a transition from family to corporate uh, to management. Um, not so long ago, the Danish Secretary, Secretary of Defense received a letter from a forester named Lars Toksvig, informing him that the oak timber Denmark had ordered in 1807 to secure the fleet was ready for delivery. <laughs> <clears throat> now today, this type of planning sounds preposterous, but perhaps that ability to project far, very far into the future, is exactly what we need to relearn. <clears throat> I am currently trying to steer my company towards its 200th anniversary. Now, I took over in 1996, uh, and in 1997 we had our 100th anniversary. And after you celebrate 100, the only goal that's worth looking at, seriously, is 200. It's 115 this year. <clears throat> in another few years, we'll have 120th. Hopefully, I'll be around for 125th anniversary. But my goal is to see the company reach 200 years. And I'm setting the company up to do that. Today, I'm going to tell you a little bit how. We build 
foundations for infrastructure. In fact, I like to think we build the foundations of infrastructure. We've been doing it for a long time. We're not terribly clever or, or business savvy. It's just that Canada is a very young country. We've always needed new railways, new ports, new harbors, new cell phone towers, new airports, and um, currently new subways. And so our company has always thrived on the growth of the country. Um, we invent solutions to foundation problems. So these are a bit eclectic. I don't think anyone will, will place an order today for one. But, <clears throat> but very often in, in our business, uh, people are constrained by, well, this is how it has to be done, or this is the way it has been done. And our company has been able to find new ways to do very old, timeless things, and sometimes with, with dramatic results. We build foundations here locally. I gave some pictures of the Henley Bridge and the Toronto waterfront. If you're ever walking on the docks by the waterfront, we build all the docks there. Um, we also uh, we drive, we, we, we drive piles in the ground. My grandfather called this the business of driving sharp pointed sticks in the ground. Uh, we do it for other contractors. Uh, in, out west, we, we work as a subcontractor to contractors and do the work for them. We also supply equipment to do nice things like rebuild all the levees in, in uh, New Orleans. We had 15 sets of equipment and hammers working for companies like Peter Kiewit to help rebuild the, the levees and the storm surge barriers. Now, I think the most important part in these stories are the transitions, the points where one generation uh, comes to an end and another generation starts. And rather than have a, just a, a word up there, I put a picture of my father because it's a Royal Winter Fair and he loved this time of year uh, when he was uh, president at the fair every night. Um, like everybody, their father's the most powerful and influential person in their life, and I couldn't imagine how I could take over from my father, and I didn't want to take over from my father. He was doing a great job, as far as I was concerned. Um, he was about 67, and then we had a, a, a bit of news from our accountant that an operation we had in, in, the, in, uh, in New York State had gone bad. The, the division had lost money. That wasn't so bad. We made money in Canada. But the problem was there was an intercompany debt which had been accruing over a number of years. And with the failure of the U.S. business, it called into question the, the uh, intercompany debt. And it was basically that asset was wiped off the balance sheet. And overnight, all of the equity that my father had built up over 30 plus years uh, or more in the business was wiped out. And our bank was very concerned and they wanted to know how we were going to repay the loan. Um, that meant that we needed to have an immediate action plan. And I spoke to my father and I said, we need to come up with a plan. And I could tell that he really didn't have the stomach for it. It meant uh, firing some people, probably closing the US office. And um, so I asked him if he would rather I take over. And um, in one second, sorry it's emotional, but it is. Uh, when my father was in charge, he was really in charge. He was absolute supreme leader. And in one second, with a shake of a hand, I was in charge. My father never questioned anything I did after the transition. It was for me to, wit to be successful or fail, and he was happy with the outcome. Sorry, I have to move on to something lighter. <laughs> you never know how this is going to catch you. I never have these feelings, except when I talk about my family business. And I guess I can share it with other people that have family businesses. But I started very young. You can see here, uh, my seventh uh, Christmas, I received a nice piece of equipment. And it wasn't, built, it wasn't bought in a store. Um, it was made, handmade by my grandfather, uh, Spike Birmingham. And on the back of the crane, it doesn't say Birmingham Construction. It says Patrick Birmingham Construction. Did my sister get a crane? No, she got a doll. <laughs> my, my brother. He got books. He's a lawyer today at Blake Castles. Uh, my younger sister wasn't born yet. My grandfather took the time to build this crane, and he was imprinting in me where he was planning for the future even then. When we come to the end of the story, you'll see that I climbed into this crane a bit like a squirrel going in a trap, and I'm still trying to get out <laughs> of the family business. Now, everything was going swimmingly. In, in, uh, when I was 14, I was building uh, new types of construction equipment and won the science fair. Everything was tracking very well. But then you enter into those teenage years, which are risky, and I became quite interested in sculpture because it was about making and it was creative. And I'm kind of a creative guy, so I thought this could be fun. And, and I decided to unenroll from engineering at Queen's and instead um, study sculpture. And, and then after I went to 
uh, out of engineering to, uh, into art, I transferred to London, England, and went to St. Martin's. And my father was really despondent. I didn't appreciate at the time why he was such a sort of sour puss about it, but his whole succession plan was based on me taking over. And so he very skillfully negotiated that if he would support me at art school, and I paid for some of it myself, but he, I need some help, that I would come back and work for the company for two years afterwards. And he figured it wouldn't hurt me to know a little bit about business. Um, when I was at art school, the closest thing I got to construction was building a house for a, a nice lady in the country and um, had fun doing that. But when I came back to the company, I didn't have any of the skills or business acumen that, that you need to run a business. I was put in charge of inventing new things and, um, and using my capacity for 3D visualization to help rethink how we could build the, the work we do and how we could um, become more, uh, more efficient. We invented a thing called Statnamic, which is a, a method of load testing foundations. And it was used to test the Taipei 101, the world's tallest building at the time. And it's a wonderful, exciting tool that creates crowds of people. You can see it on the Discovery Channel, or Frontiers of Construction. Uh, we make very large and very uh, uh, scary equipment for drilling holes and for driving piles in the ground, and we sell it to Europeans and Japanese contractors. Now, I mentioned the transition in 96, uh, that's when I took over. In the first year, I didn't need a succession plan because it didn't matter if I wasn't going to succeed, we wouldn't need it. It was just going to be over. I took over because I wanted to save my father the embarrassment of having a liquidation and an auction sale of the equipment. We really were insolvent. When I took over, we hadn't paid bills in six months. We had zero cash. I had $10 million in debt and I had about $8 million in assets and that was it. But I had a fantastic name, a great reputation and I had some very good people. And I took what I had and I leveraged it for success. In the first year, we made a million dollars. And that was enough to make the bank stand still, because at the time I was in special accounts. But they stood back and said, hey, wait a minute, this could be entertaining. Let's see what this art student can do. <laughs> <laughs> After year one, I knew I needed a succession plan. I need a succession plan in case I got hit by a bus. I do some dangerous things, I could die. Um, but I needed a succession plan that would work in the short term and the long term. And um, my children, my son was born in the year I took over, 96. Um, my daughter wasn't born until 2000. I couldn't look to my children for help. They're just too young. So I decided to sell shares to my employees. And I did exactly what, this, what everyone's talking about today. We did an estate freeze. I had built up, over the first three years, built up some equity. So I went from zero, below zero, to about so three million. And I said, okay, we're gonna do an estate freeze. That's mine, we turn into a class A share. And now I'm gonna open shares in the business for a dollar. Uh, but you had to put up a shareholder loan. So there was a bit of a, a governor on how many people could, uh, how many shares people could take. And I sold 20% of the business to my employees. Now a lot of, my father didn't like doing that, didn't like that idea because he never wanted to gamble with other people's money. But the reality was all my employees were gambling with my money. And, <clears throat> and, and the very little that I had. So making, making them, come in, having them come in as owners was very strategic because I couldn't pay big salaries. I needed to retain every bit of talent I had. And the only way I could keep them interested was to bring them in as owners. They were all very skeptical. They thought, what in the hell is Patrick doing? But for a dollar, they bought shares. Some people bought 20 shares, some people bought 100 shares. We started to do uh, better, but the business struggled. My natural, uh, I'm very good at emergencies, by the way, and firefighting, but we would go uh, gangbusters and then have a, a reversal. So it was very rough and it was very difficult. Uh, we didn't really talk about it, but the debt to equity ratio was 10 to one when I took over and the bank was always trying to get me to get it down to four to one and then three and a half to one. And so e our equity was very key. I was always focused on how much equity he had, trying to keep the debt to equity ratio in line. I decided that we needed to build a team. This, this, um, the rugged individual style of my father wouldn't work for myself. And I went to a course in Toronto called Strategic Coach. And they told me that you need to think about things like this. And quite frankly, being an artist, I love these little pictures. It's not hard to read. And I saw that the vision part I was really good at because I, I can see long term like artists do. I can think ahead. And I could see where I wanted the company to be, but I didn't know how to get it there. And the reality was that as we were building equity and pulling ourselves out of the turnaround, 
I did, went to one talk and they said, if you work on your weaknesses, you get very strong weaknesses. And I said, that's it. I'm firing myself today. <laughs> I, I fired, I realized I could be an owner, but I did not need to run the company. I could see that we, I knew where we were standing and I knew where I wanted to go, but I could not get everybody. I, I couldn't do what I, my vice president uh, could do. I couldn't tell everybody what to carry in their pack, uh, how to pack it, make sure everyone was happy along the way. I just didn't understand why everyone didn't follow me to the top of the mountain. So I hired a professional manager, someone with great experience in running a company bigger than ours. And this man, Peter Smith, joined our company. And the first thing I did when he joined, he came in January, mid-January, is I left for a month in February. I left the whole business in charge, gave him one instruction, do the right thing. We had both read a book called Built to Last. And he had read it and I read it and I said, do what you think is right. Now, Two things, you know, people always have a hard time hiring. If he wasn't any good, well, I would know when I came back in a month that we needed to fire, hire somebody else. But in fact, he did very well. And I gave him the responsibility and the control immediately. And everybody recognized if they had a problem, got to go to Peter. Patrick's not here. He's in Chile. In fact, he's on the top of a mountain. And you can't even phone him. Um, so that worked. We started to do better. Uh, we started to clean up all our messes, get our energy going in one direction. Being, having the shareholder program enabled me to communicate to all the key employees where we wanted to go strategically, and they all started pulling in the same direction, whereas previously everyone was pulling in different directions. You know how that is. Um, we started to increase our revenue, and that was exciting. Every year we do a little bit more and more. One year we did as much business in six months as we had done previously in a whole year. So I thought, geez, that's pretty exciting. And uh, business, construction business kept growing. It's always rough, but it goes up. And then the most exciting part was we started to make money, like really make money. Uh, this is, these are half year results, and you can see exactly where Peter Smith joined, 2003. Okay, so we were not doing very well then. And we started to do better and better. And it, wasn't, it was simply because he got everybody going in the right direction. And I recognized that, that this wasn't my strength. I mean, I knew it all along. Um, we got enough momentum going, basically we started to have four, five, six, seven years of continuous profit, each year being better than the previous. And I decided that the only thing we were missing now was to be properly financed. And we engaged a, a gentleman who's here today, John Lowen, and his company to, to help to find us a perfect equity partner. And uh, John made a very detailed um, uh, computer model of our business. He, he saw himself, the future growth in the business. In fact, he later became a partial uh, shareholder in the business. And in 2007, we went out to the market and we got five offers um, easily in one week. And we didn't take the most, let's say, a high-priced offer. We took the company that we thought we could work with the best. And as a, as a caution to everybody, what went wrong, well, the, the private equity was great. We had money, business, went, business boomed even more. We started to really realize our potential as a company. And part of this was me recognizing that I can't provide my company everything it needs. I can't give it all the capital it needs, don't have all the right management skills, but I want the company to succeed, and conversely, I want my family to succeed. So I need to find what my company needs and feed it. And as I started to take this position, we did better and better. But what we didn't think about was that the private equity company fell apart. After 2008, they lost the money that they had. We thought they had a lot of money, that $80 million, but they lost most of it in the stock market. And then they uh, became insolvent, became subject to a hostile takeover. And in 2010, we bought them out. So it was a bit unfortunate because we were doing very well at that time. We, we bought our company back. And then we turned around and we sold it again, this time not to private equity, but to a strategic partner. Now, the moral of the story here is the whole exercise of selling to private equity gave us a phenomenal um, experience in understanding the value of our company. When we went to the, the next level of negotiation, which was for majority stake, the, the equity partner was a minority, I knew the value of my company. I'd already sold it once, I'd put it on the street and got five offers, and I'd bought it back. So I knew exactly what it cost. I just looked at the bill. And um, so, so uh, I had a lot of confidence going into the next round of negotiation. And we picked a strategic partner, not just anybody, but um, a company called Solitange Fresene, who we'd put on a target list when we started the, uh, when we, in 2007, when we started this exercise, we wrote down a list of ideal companies to buy us. 
Soliton Fresnay is owned by Vinci. Vinci is the largest construction company in the world. But more importantly, Soliton Vinci does, Soliton Fresnay does really cool stuff. They've just built the largest cable stay bridge in the world in Russia. They, we knew them by their reputation as being a very technical company. And as it turned out, they knew us. They had a big dossier and file on the things that we'd done. So we were a target company for them, them for us. And we sold, I don't have a pointer, I don't think, here. Uh, we sold on the basis of 2009 and 2010. But you'll see there's a dip in the profit. That's the cost of doing the transaction. In the year that we did the negotiation with Solotaj, we had all our focus on doing this deal. And even though we'd been through it before, we had all our due diligence organized, it was very stressful. And uh, it, it caused the business to suffer. But I'm happy to say that this year, we're back up to a higher level than we were previously, having a record year on, on uh, lower revenue. We're making more money. And the company is not over. The, I, I still have a buyout. Uh, my, my, the balance of my shares will be bought out in uh, 2016. So the, the, one of the secrets to selling your business is you can't sell it on the spot market. It's got to be sold over a period of time if you want to really hedge your bets or maximize your value. Uh, because with the introduction of Solotanche, our company's staged to do bigger and better things. We, we do this type of, uh, of construction where we're working in cantilever. And some people call this the industrialization of construction. We're actually changing the way the construction is done, not using cranes. Um, we're developing new equipment to work in Australia and work in other places, to work over the ocean and over environmentally sensitive uh, areas to, um, to work basically from the air as opposed to from a crawler on the ground. And, sorry, and this moral of the story here is that for all of my young employees, I have a whole raft of new 20 and 30 year old employees, they have a new parent. And the new parent is, a, is one of the best financed and one of the biggest companies in the world. And they can do much more than I can, and certainly much more than my children can, to give them a great and exciting career. For the company, I'm leaving the company debt free and with, a, out, with, a, with every reasonable prospect of it succeeding to its 200th anniversary. Myself, I'm working more on my sculpture and really enjoying that and my family growing up to follow its own path and career in life. Thank you very much. So, sorry for the choking up there, but you know, I, I never get emotional about my father. It's just that um, this particular subject is a nerve and uh, per perhaps some of you have already uh, passed your company on to your children or maybe some of you inherited your business from your father. You might understand the, the loaded uh, nature of it. Tremendous story, Patrick. Uh, thanks, um, thanks so much. Uh, so I, I, I think one of the clear takeaways was that uh, you recognized your strengths, but also your, your, your shortcomings. And, yeah. and you uh, obviously took a, a very proactive approach in, in shoring them up, use a term from your, your <laughs> business, but creating the structure again to uh, create the strength that the company now has. Yeah. The company's never been stronger than it is today. Which is, uh, again, a lot of bold steps along the way and, uh, and just a, an awesome, powerful story. Are there any, any questions from the floor, please? Yes. Arnie. Arnie. The uh, employees who had shares, yes. did they cash out the first time you sold or the second time? Oh, it's a great question. Some cashed out and a little bit of money went off the table with the first private equity, um, but no one took very much out because the, the private equity company wanted uh, everybody to be in. I was able to take my class A shares out. From my point of view, if we, everything ended there, I was happy. I had, I had, from my point of view, a lot of money, from an artistic point of view, a lot of money, uh, from an artist's perspective. But uh, subsequently, most people cashed out with the introduction of the strategic investor, but myself and another 10 investors still own shares. I only sold 60% of my shares, and I've kept 40 in the company. And that's also helping to ease the transition and keep everybody focused. So again, a lot of uh, steps along the way. You had an opportunity to get into the family business. Now you've taken some chips off the table, but do you feel any regret at all not giving your children the opportunity to be part of the family business, or would there be an opportunity otherwise? Well, no, great question. Um, I can tell you honestly, I have absolutely zero regret. I spoke to my children at every step along the way. Again, they're very young. They're, they've grown up now. They're, they're uh, 16 and 13. but. Um, I didn't want to go in the family business. I, I, uh, I somewhat resented the fact that I was streamed or channeled from an early age. I saw these exciting things I could be doing, but I, 
I, I knew I had a sort of path in life or a destiny, and uh, I did not want, I do not want to, I want my children to follow their dream, to follow, to do what they're passionate about. They'll be very successful. I could help them in business. They can both work for the company. The, 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 the current owner and management would love to have them work there, but they don't have the responsibility of being the parent and being in charge of it all. So there's no barrier to them working there. I told them, everybody, the same story. If my children would knock me down, steal the keys out of my hand, then they could, they could run the business. But the fact is they were too young to knock me down, so they couldn't do it. <laughs> but that, that should be the requirement for every family, is if your children won't actually push you down and take the keys, then I wouldn't bother. Did I answer the question? Yes. Yeah. No, and also, yeah, I can see my children are developing their own skills. My son's quite good at French. He's good at math. He likes computer science. He's going his own way. Um, and my daughter, I don't know what she'll do. They're, bo they're both capable of running the business. They're not idiots. But, um, uh, <laughs> but uh, the business is currently being run by a, a whole group of professional engineers who all, and the most important question when I ask someone, when I hire somebody who's an engineer, I say, I ask them a lot of technical questions. I say, how did you choose your career? And if any of them say their parents chose it for them, out. <laughs> they have to choose it themselves. The people who work in my business love it. It's their chosen path in life. And they're the only people that I hire. <laughs> That's a good question. Well, she doesn't ride so much. Um, so she's uh, taking the picture. <laughs> no. So when I took over in 96, um, we had two things. We had, this, uh, we had to sell our house in Toronto, move back to Hamilton. We had kind of a nice life here. She's a writer. And uh, she was pretty scared. The, the odds were really stacked against me. I, I did not have any business acumen at all. And um, so she was incredibly supportive. In fact, what she said was that, never mind, if we lose it all, if the business is gone, we can always get a, a trailer in Florida, and we'll call it Balti Vinyl. The company at the name was called, time was called Balti Daniel. And giving me the support to know that she would stay with me or love me, whether I, the business succeeded or failed, was all the support I needed to simply go at it, hammer and tong. And likewise for my father, whether win or lose, they were both behind me. And that kind of support is invaluable. And uh, away we went. She, she had a friend who worked at uh, McKenzie. She faxed us on the weekend. The 20 steps to turning around a business came in on our fax machine, and we just started doing them one after another. She helped write the reports to the bank, and, and uh, together we got through. And of course, she's a, not an owner in the business, but she's a half owner in, every, in all of my assets. We're, we're life partners, so it's, it's all her success as well. Yeah, I'll tell you exactly what I did was uh, when I took over, then we had, uh, uh, you know, like $3 million in payables, zero cash, and nobody had been paid for months. So I, I quickly figured out that I need to talk to the biggest people, the biggest uh, um, uh, receivables. So I jumped on a plane, I went to Montreal, and I sat down with a guy face to face, and I said, look, I didn't cause this problem, but I'm going to fix it, and I need you to to hold hard for six months and then I'll, I'll start repaying. I basically deferred about $3 million worth of payables immediately in the first four days. And I did it because I was honest and I was straight and people believed me. And it worked. Subsequently, I started selling the equipment. The only unused, un, um, uh, unrealized asset we had on the balance sheet was equipment. And so I sold equipment that was very, very old, and I got 180% of our book value. And every time I sold it, then I leased a new piece of equipment. And I sold another crane to Africa with leads, and I started to create cash, because I sure as hell needed it. The bank wouldn't give any. And then I did something really tricky. I got, sta after six months, I had it stable enough, but I still needed more money. I bought a new suit at Harry Rosen. I went to Japan. I had a patent on the statinamic device, and I hawked it. I loaned it to a Japanese contractor, very big contractor, for half a million dollars at, get this, I think it was 2% interest at the time, or 4% interest. People here couldn't imagine, interest here was 10 or 12%. I, I hawked it for 4% interest with no, um, re, no fixed repayment terms. And that half a million stopped the bank in their tracks. It enabled me to, to stabilize the business, and then I was able to get some new financing with Roynet and totally stabilize the business 
but I had to use an asset that wasn't charged to the bank, and the bank had no interest in the patents. And that, that trip, when I sat down again, told an honest story. That it was really funny, the Japanese the guy I was meeting with, the president, didn't speak English at all. But the accountant could understand the balance sheet exactly, because it's exactly the same. And when they saw the numbers, most construction companies, when they fail, they never come back. It, it happens over and over again. And um, they, they thought the money was lost. But a year later, I paid them back in full. So that's how I did it. Remarkable story. Yeah. Patrick, uh, I can't thank you enough well, for sharing uh, so much uh, of the Birmingham story, uh, personally and business-wise. Thanks. Thank you, man. Okay.